So how many of you know what a postscript on a letter is? A postscript. The abbreviation is PS. So kids, young people, in the old days, in the old days, people used to send things called emails. And emails stood for electronic mail. And in the even older days, people used to send normal mail with things called letters, where you would write somebody with a pen or type it on a typewriter, and you would send a letter. And in the days before computers, if you were going to write a letter and do it fancy, you had to do it on a typewriter. And the thing about typewriters was, as you'd push the button, it would put the letter on the page. So there was no going back and deleting and changing things, unless you wanted to, to kind of throw the whole page away and type the whole thing again, or maybe take some little wet white paint. You'd actually paint out mistakes. And so in the old days, if you had to write a letter somewhat painfully like that, or maybe by hand, what if you got to the end of your letter and you realized, oh no, I forgot, I forgot to say something about the barbecue next week or something. You didn't, if you needed to add something to a letter, you didn't want to have to go back and rewrite the whole thing. So you would use this abbreviation on the bottom, PS, which stands for postscript, meaning after what is written, and you could put your little note there. Now, interestingly, you can just keep adding P's to that for more posts. You can have P-P-S, post, postscript for your second one. P-P-P-S, the post, post, postscript. You can just keep going on for infinity. Now, you won't see this much anymore because now it's easy to go back and, um, you know, uh, type something in up higher in the letter or just uh, adjust your email and put it up there. However, there is one place where you will still commonly see P-S's in the mail or email, and these are marketing letters. If you get a letter in the mail for marketing or an email, check it out, see if we're right. Most of the time, it'll have a PS on the bottom. That's because researchers have showed if you get a marketing email, 90% of people will just scan over it, and if there's a PS, they'll read that first. So they recognize the value of this is like, okay, what is down here? And sometimes they'll print it in a different font even to try to get our attention because they know this is something that can uh, be used to highlight their main point or their final plea with you to sign up for their watermelon of the month subscription box club or whatever it is they're trying to push, okay? Well, today we come to the end of Paul's letter of 1 Corinthians, and he has a kind of PS at the end. It's kind of his postscript, the last little blurb. And just like someone writing a marketing email, or that's not exactly right, not exactly like someone uh, writing a marketing email, but similar to someone writing a marketing email who wants to put a PS to highlight some main point, here at the end, Paul actually takes a pen in hand himself and adds his own PS, his final highlights and his final comments on some key themes. And one of these key themes has to do with who Jesus is. And in fact, hidden here in this postscript is one of the most important verses in the whole Bible, I will suggest to you. And that's because this verse is going to speak right to who Jesus is in terms of his divinity. Because listen, outside there in the big wide world, lots of people will say, oh, you Christians, you're so silly. Because you Christians believe that Jesus is in some sense God, right? You worship Jesus as God, but that's so silly, Christians. Don't you realize the earliest Christians knew that Jesus was just a man, he was just a prophet, just a good teacher, and over time, this evolved into later Christians worshiping Jesus as God. But this is not how it really was in the beginning, they will say. So I'll give you an example. Do you remember the Da Vinci Code? Some of you around 20 years ago, Da Vinci Code, a novel by Dan Brown, great book, really, good action novel, uh, movie starring... Was it Tom Hanks? I think Tom Hanks is in the Da Vinci Code. So a great action movie in one sense, but unfortunately this, the book and the movie claim to be historical and truthful and a lot of the details it interacted with in terms of the story of Christianity and it really is not the case. So for example, I'll show you on the screen here, I'll put up some text from the book. Here's an interaction in the book between the main character and a sort of professorial um, wise figure who's telling the main character the real truth about Jesus' divinity. So on the screen, my dear, T. Bing declared, until that moment in history, he's talking about the Council of Nicaea, 325, all right, the Council of Nicaea that put forth the Nicene Creed showing what Christians believe about God. Until that moment in history, Jesus was viewed by his followers as a mortal prophet, a great and powerful man, but a man nonetheless, a mortal main character. Not the son of God? Right, 
Teabing said, Jesus' establishment as the Son of God was officially proposed and voted on by the Council of Nicaea. Hold on. You're saying Jesus' divinity was the result of a vote? A relatively close vote at that, Teabing added. And he goes on. And so you will, now anyone who knows much about this will really not say such an absurd thing, but you will run into this out there in the world. People will say things like, oh, Jesus wasn't viewed as God until the Roman Empire, Emperor Constantine assembled the Council of Nicaea, and then the Christians said, Jesus is now God, and now we're going to worship him. Well, that's really not the case. The reality is, Christians had always understood Jesus to be God and worshipped him as God in some sense. But for a while, we weren't sure about how to carefully define that. That's what Nicaea helped with. But what we'll see here today in this passage, in this postscript that Paul gives, is a very key scripture verse that in fact shows that the worship of Jesus as some kind of divinity is not a late and legendary addition that grows into Christianity, but is actually something that's present from the very early days. So for this reason, it'll be important for us to pay attention because this issue speaks rightly to the heart of Christianity, which is, who is Jesus? And as Christians, we believe that Jesus is both human, but also fully God. So this passage uh, will break up into five parts as we read Paul's little postscript, but we'll spend most of our time in part four as we zero in on this key passage that speaks directly or perhaps indirectly to the divinity of Jesus. So I hope you have an outline in the bulletin. Those of you online, you can download one there and have it with you. Uh, That'll be handy. If you're here in the room, you can get up and grab one from the tables in the back if you need one. Okay, so let's go through this and wrap up Paul's letter to the first Corinthians. Here's part one, which I'm calling Greetings from Ephesus with Love. And we'll pick up here in 1 Corinthians 16, 19. Paul writes, The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. So here's a couple, a husband and wife team, that we see quite a bit in Paul's letters. Now, this couple is some very valued close friends, supporters, and co-workers of Paul. Now, we should probably really pronounce the name Aquila. It's a Latin word for eagle. Uh, And her name is really is not Priscilla. Her real name is Prisca. And in fact, Paul always calls her Prisca. It's the book of Acts that uses her nickname, Priscilla. Priscilla is actually the nickname. It means little Prisca. So if you want to name your daughter after this person, I suggest what you should do is don't name her Priscilla. Name her Prisca. That's the name. And then you can give her the nickname Priscilla, which means little Prisca. Isn't she so cute? All right, now these two are valued co-workers of Paul. Uh, we learn from the New Testament they're Jewish and they're Christians, uh, but they're from Rome. Now interestingly, both of them have Latin names, however. This suggests that they were either slaves or, as is more likely, they are now freed persons. So they are former slaves, probably of some influential and wealthy Roman household, because we see these two have quite a bit of wealth, at least by ancient standards, because we see them moving around a lot. Uh, They go from Rome to Corinth, where Paul meets them, from Ephesus, and then back to Rome. You can see here, as Paul sends greetings from them, they have a church that meets in their house. So they own a home big enough to host a church there in the city of Corinth. I'm sorry, in Ephesus. But Paul met him in Corinth. And because they were already Christians, and and Acts tells us they had fled from Rome when the Roman emperor had ordered all the Jews out of Rome. And we read about this in our Roman historian Suetonius, who says, I think it was Claudius was the emperor. He ordered all the Jews out of Rome. And Suetonius writes and says, this was because the instigations over one Crestus. Crestus, does that sound familiar? It sounds very close to Christ. It's spelled wrong. But apparently what was going on, there were some riots, severe problems within the Jewish community in Rome. And this led the emperor to command all the Jews out of Rome. And Priscilla and Aquila left because of this. And very plausibly, this was debate and conflict in the synagogues over Jesus between Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians. In any rate, Priscilla and Aquila, they flee to Corinth. That's where Paul meets them. And they are leather workers, which is also what Paul was. And so Paul actually lives with them and stays with them and works with them for his time in Corinth. 
Archaeologically, they probably lived and worked in a small shop there on the main street. Priscilla and Aquila, Prisca and Aquila would have lived and slept upstairs. Paul probably would have slept downstairs in the workshop on the bench. Paul will later write in the book of Romans of these two, he will say, they risked their neck for me. Probably in Ephesus, as Paul alludes to the trials and troubles he's undergoing even now as he writes this letter to the Corinthians. So as he wraps up this letter, Prisca and Aquila, who the Corinthians know are with Paul, and so Paul sends and extends greetings from them. Look at verse 20. All the brothers and the sisters here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. So here's an ancient Christian practice that drew upon the ways that family would interact with one another. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Interestingly, there's some evidence this was not just kisses on the cheeks, but also kisses on the lips. And completely surprisingly to me, this was also apparently in the Christian community practice between genders. So it wasn't just men kissing men and women kissing women. We see multiple commands to do this in the New Testament. So let's obey. Everybody stand up. Just kidding, just kidding. Ophelia, you used, to, you used to not like greeting time. Imagine if we made, you know, those of you at home, maybe you'd be all right, but. So why did they do this? Well, this was a way of showing family connection. Like in the ancient world, you would kiss close friends and family. So this was a ritual practice built into the worship of the early church to show family ties and unity as now here is the true family we were a part of. But as you expect, this could lead to some trouble. And um, interestingly, the Greco-Roman world, as they looked at the Christians, in the second century, there were three rumors that were spread about Christians. One was that we were atheists and didn't believe in gods. Why? Because we didn't use any statues in our worship. We didn't worship any idols. Two, the rumor was we were cannibals. Why? We had secret meetings where we ate flesh and blood of someone. And three, the rumor was we practiced um, orgiastic, orgiastic, immoral parties. Why? We had secret meetings, and the Christians called them love feasts. Oh, yeah, incestuous, by the way. They thought we were incestuous. Why? Because we had secret meetings we called love feasts. We called each other brother and sister. And what else did we do when we gathered? We kissed each other on the lips or the cheek. So this led to a lot of rumors. So in the second century, there's a Christian apologist named Athenagoras who writes to the Roman emperor to try to dissuade and dispel these rumors. And talking about the kiss, look what he says here as he tries to to counter this rumor that we practiced incestuous orgies. Look at this on the screen. Athenagoras writes, To the emperor, speaking of our laws, our Christian ways, this law teaches us to have the same measure of justice for ourselves as for our neighbors. For this reason, too, we consider according to age, some as sons and daughters, others we regard as brothers and sisters, and our elders we honor as fathers and mothers. We consider them as brothers and sisters and give them other names of kinship, and therefore we set great store by keeping their bodies free from violation and corruption. Our laws say, furthermore, if any man takes a second kiss for the motive of pleasure, etc. So notice, somewhere along the line, we needed a rule on this holy kiss of greeting in the church. What was the rule? Only one, okay? Only one. We have to be so precise about that kiss, or rather the salutation, since if any of us were even in the least stirred to passion and thought thereby, God would set him outside eternal life. Notice how hardcore Athenagoras is. In the holy kiss in church, if you are some way interested in what comes about from that holy kiss, hell, okay? We were hardcore in those days, very hardcore, But notice, this was a beautiful practice that showed real bonds of family connection and kinship. And notice Paul does specify it is a holy kiss. So this was entirely innocent to show that, okay, here is the true family we're part of. Now, I don't think we should practice this in our culture. I think it would cause more trouble than it would bring help or benefit. Though there are still churches that do this. Out of curiosity, anybody ever been to a church that did this? Sometimes it's called passing the peace. Yeah, sometimes it's still out there. But I think it is something beautiful, right? Something is lost when we moved away from this clear, engaged practice of family solidarity. I mean, it's more than a handshake. You handshake anybody. But the kiss was really reserved for like family and close friends or honored people. So obviously we're not going to go back to that. But it is worth thinking about. 
Like, okay, what are ways that we can acknowledge and build into our practice the acknowledgement that, look, in Christ, this is our true family. Truer ties then biologically. And Paul uh, encourages the Corinthians to continue to practice this. Look at part two. Autograph for authenticity and affection. Kids, what's an autograph? Anyone know this word? What is an autograph? What's an, a signature. Yeah, you sign your name. Exactly. So look what happens here. Look at verse 21. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. This tells us who wrote the rest of the letter. Someone else. And this is standard practice in the ancient world. Writing is not as easy as it is now. It was a specialized uh, role and task and occupation. And even if you could write, like Paul can, you would typically still hire and work with a scribe to help you write an actual letter. You'd sit down, you'd go back and forth, you'd maybe do some rough drafts, you'd brainstorm together. And in fact, we probably see who Paul's scribe is right at the beginning of 1 Corinthians. So look at the screen. Here's the first verse of the letter. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. That's interesting, Sosthenes. Notice there's other Christians with Paul in Corinth. He doesn't say Paul and Prisca and Aquila. He doesn't say anybody else. Who's Sosthenes? Well, this is probably the Christ, notice our brother Sosthenes. So here's a fellow Christian in this case who is serving as Paul's scribe as he dictates and goes back and forth and pens this letter to the Corinthians. Okay, but what's going on here at the end? I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Now Paul says, all right, Sosthenes, give it to me. And he takes his own hand, he takes his own pen, and he writes now his own signature, his own PS to the bottom of this. Why? Well, this could show authenticity if they know his handwriting. This is really from him. But also this just conveys kind of respect and affection. Just like if you print off some letter to a friend, you might, physically, if you're doing an actual letter, if anyone does that anymore, I don't know. You might add some handwritten thing at the bottom just to convey, all right, I, I went through more than, than just whipping this off the printer for you. And I think we should understand that what Paul writes in his own hand now is the rest of this. So it's not just that greeting. The rest of this now, he's probably writing in his own hand. As such, as a PS, if you will, he is now going to highlight some key things he wishes to remind the Corinthians of and exhort them too. So, part three. Look. Covenant warning, stay faithful. Now, this is a strange verse. Okay, this one is surprising. Uh, it seems to come out of nowhere, and it's very strong. Look at verse 22. If anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Whoa. Did you ever write that in a PS in your letters? If anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. That's serious business. That's very jarring. I think there's two contexts for us to uh, keep in mind here to help us understand this. The first context is Paul seems to be drawing here on the language of covenant faithfulness and unfaithfulness. What is a covenant? Kids, is a, a covenant is a deal or an agreement you make. And so in the Old Testament, when God saved his people Israel and brought them out of Egypt, he saved them by grace, he redeemed them, he delivered them out of bondage, and he said, okay, now I'm going to make a covenant with you. And we have the law of Moses, the Torah, the rules that God gave. God said to Israel, you'll be my people, here's the deal, you are to follow me and be faithful to me. The language of loving God belongs to the category of language talking about faithfulness to that covenant. So look at the most important command in the Old Testament, the, the center of Judaism down to today. This is Deuteronomy 6 on the screen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Notice love the Lord. That doesn't mean merely have affection for God. To love the Lord means to be faithful to him, to maintain your allegiance to him, to remain faithful to the covenant that he has made out of grace with you, his people, in the Old Testament. Skipping ahead some chapters in the same book of Deuteronomy, God puts in multiple chapters of what is going to happen to Israel if they choose not to love the Lord, if they do not remain faithful to the covenant, and in fact, if they violate the covenant. What is going to happen? They will receive curses from God. And so there's lots of verses we could look at. I'll just read a few. Look at this, Deuteronomy 28. Notice, however... 
If you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and rebuke in everything you put your hand to until you are destroyed and come to sudden ruin because of the evil you have done and forsaken him. Does this happen in the history of Israel? Go like this. Yeah, it does. They are unfaithful to the covenant and God brings outside nations and wipes out the northern kingdom completely, sends the southern kingdom into exile. So in Paul's understanding of biblical theology and relationship with God, God has granted the old covenant to Israel, but what has happened now since Jesus? There's now a what? A new covenant. Remember Jesus on the night he's betrayed. He takes the, the, the cup in communion and says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So now there's a new deal. God has saved us not out of Egypt by Moses' hand, but he has saved us from sin and death by Jesus' death and resurrection. And if you are a follower of a Jesus, in Jesus, you are part of that covenant with him. So what are we obligated to do? To remain faithful to the covenant, to love the Lord. And what will happen if we are unfaithful to the covenant? Curses. And so there's the first context for this verse. It's the language of covenant faithfulness. Second context is, who is, who is Paul writing to with this? Christians, yes. And what kind of Christians? They have all their act together, doing everything right that they should be? No, right? I mean, there are severe dysfunctions and problems in the Corinthian church. Some of them are going and worshiping idols and, and maintaining uh, connections with uh, pagan idolatrous worship in Corinth. And so this seems to be Paul's last warning to these elements in the church that are not loving the Lord, who are not remaining faithful to Jesus. Paul has warned them further in the letter. He talked about Israel and how they came out of Egypt and in the wilderness they were unfaithful to God and God killed them. This is the same thing Paul is warning them of, the curses of God coming on them for unfaithfulness to the covenant. And I think we should read that capital C, damnation. Like, if you abandon faith in Jesus Corinthians, Paul says, you are lost utterly and completely. So here's Paul writes in his own hand, here's a final warning to, to, to everybody that's on the wrong path there in Corinth. If anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Who's the Lord for Paul when he writes like this? Who's he mean by the Lord? Most of the time, he means Jesus. Now there's some muddying of the waters because sometimes Paul will use this term Lord to talk about God the Father. But most of the time when Paul uses Lord like this, he means Jesus. And so here's the focal point of our loyalty and faithfulness now in the covenant that we have through Christ. So Paul says we must remain loyal to Jesus. We must continue to love him and remain faithful to the covenant that we have entered into agreement with at our conversion our baptism, when we confess Jesus as Lord. Okay, but we're really interested in part four. We'll spend a little longer here. Here's, here's uh, I think, one of the most important verses in the whole Bible. So part four, evidence of divinity, ancient prayer to Jesus as Lord. Notice we said when Paul says Lord, he most of the time means Jesus. Okay, look at the second half of verse 22. It's just two words. What is it? Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Who's he talking to? Jesus. Come, Lord. What kind of speech is that? Come, Lord. Prayer. Yes. Notice this is a prayer formula. Paul is not making a statement. He is saying to Jesus, the Lord, come. Now, um, is that the language you would use for a dead prophet? Or just someone who is a good teacher? Probably not. Who do we speak to using formulas like praying? God. So here is an early piece of evidence that the Christians are somehow including Jesus in their prayers, in their worship. Jesus is being called Lord here. He is being prayed to. What coming is Jesus, I'm sorry, what coming is Paul asking for? Could be like his presence in worship, some have suggested. 
come Jesus as we celebrate communion, more likely, most people say, it's that capital C coming that the Christians are hoping for, the return of Christ to restore all things. So notice here is a very high perspective on Jesus. Jesus is being prayed to. Now, most of the time in Christian prayer, what the standard way we should go about it, the way that most Christians have most of the time have prayed, even in the New Testament, is typically our prayers are addressed to God the Father, and we pray through Jesus or in the name of Jesus and by the Holy Spirit. So we involve the whole Trinity, praying to the Father, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit. But there are plenty of examples in the New Testament where prayers are actually addressed to Jesus himself as God, and here is one of them. Now, does this mean Paul believes that there's more than one God? No, confusingly. Back in 1 Corinthians 8, he's already said, no, there is one God and one Lord. So Paul held on to his Jewish monotheism. No, there's one God, and yet Paul and the other early Christians kind of mysteriously include Jesus within the identity of the one God of Israel. And so here we see Jesus sharing in something that would typically be reserved to God alone for a Jewish person, which is prayer. So here is a very early evidence of Jesus being included in worship and actually prayed to as divinity. Now, it gets even more significant than that, however. Look on your outline. I've printed for you the footnote that the NIV translation puts down at the bottom of the page key to this verse. Look what it says. They're telling us, it says this, the Greek for come, Lord, reproduces an Aramaic expression, Maranatha, used by early Christians. So they are telling us this come Lord is written in language Aramaic. Why is this significant? Paul typically speaks Greek. The Corinthians live in Corinth. Their main language is Greek. Paul writes the letter of 1 Corinthians in Greek. However, here's an anomaly. This one little line, come Lord, Paul does not write in Greek. He writes in Aramaic. It's Maranatha. Some Bible translations will keep that. Maranatha. Sometimes they'll translate it. Come, Lord, like it does here. What's significant about this? Well, who spoke Aramaic? Well, Jesus spoke Aramaic. All right? He probably knew some Greek and spoke some Greek, too, because he lived, just grew up four miles outside of Sepphoris, a major Greco-Roman city in Galilee. But most of the time, Jesus' native language was Aramaic, kind of a form of Hebrew. And the earliest disciples and followers of Jesus then spoke what language? Also, Aramaic. So later on, the gospel spreads out to Greek-speaking Jews in Jerusalem, but the first generation of followers of Jesus spoke Aramaic. So what this is telling us, the fact that Paul puts this little prayer, come Lord, in a very formal way in Aramaic, it's an amazing preservation of what must be a very old, formalized prayer of the Christians. And notice as well, does Paul explain what that means to the Corinthians? No, he just says, Maranatha. That's not the language they speak. He assumes they know precisely what this means. He assumes they're familiar with it because he's taught it to them when he was there among them. So, so well known is this ancient, preserved, early Christian prayer. It's even maintained in the other language. And we see this show up a couple other times. Look at the book of Revelation. Here's the second to last verse in the whole Bible. This is Revelation 20, verse 20. Look up here. It says, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Look at that. There's that short little prayer again. Come, Lord. But now it says, come, Lord Jesus. In Revelation, that's in Greek. So here's the same prayer, but it's translated in Greek like everyone would expect. But here in 1 Corinthians, it is still preserved in its ancient form in Aramaic, Maranatha. Let's fast forward just barely beyond the book of Revelation. Here's an early Christian document called the Didache. It is the earliest Christian writing outside the New Testament, early 2nd century. Some people say actually from the 1st century. Some will argue the Didache is actually written before even the book of Revelation. So whatever, it's a very old Christian document, all right? And here's a part of the Didache that's giving instructions of how to celebrate communion. And they say, here's the prayer to pray when you are done with communion. Look at the last part of this prayer. So here's formalized Christian worship after we celebrate communion. Look on the screen. Remember your church, Lord, to deliver it from all evil and to make it perfect in your love. And from the four winds, gather the church that has been sanctified into your kingdom, which you have prepared for it. For yours is the power and the glory forever. May grace come, and may this world pass away. Hosanna to the God of David. If anyone is holy, let him come. If anyone is not, let him repent. Maranatha. Amen. 
Interestingly, that Memorial Day prayer I prayed today, I got off the internet from the Gospel Coalition. And what did that guy include right there in the end? Still in Aramaic, Maranatha. So the significance for us in terms of thinking about the person of Jesus is this. Look, here is, like, look, some people say, oh, no one believed Jesus was God until the year 325 when the Emperor Constantine said, Jesus is God, and then all the Christians, Christians started worshiping him. Well, what do you think? Does that make sense? It doesn't make any sense. We see, even in the New Testament, Jesus has already been called God, treated as God, worshiped, prayed to. And here's an early example of this. This letter's written in what, 55, probably? Here's the year 55, Paul writes 1 Corinthians, or so. Um, but he's preserved for them this prayer in Aramaic. He must have taught him when he was there a few years earlier, but this goes back to the earliest generation. So we see here an artifact of the earliest Christian worship to Jesus. Maranatha, come Lord, prayer to Jesus as a divinity, as to a God. Okay, so what happened in 325? What did Constantine do? So notice, from the very beginning, we believed Jesus was the Son of God. We worshipped him. We believed Jesus was divine and God in some sense. But we didn't always know precisely how to explain it. And our precision in explaining it grew over the years, particularly prompted by Christian teachers that would start teaching something that sounded not quite right. We say, wait a minute, that's not what the apostles taught. That's not what the scripture said. And we get together and talk about it and reject it. So what happened in Nicaea was there was a Christian priest, a Christian teacher from Alexandria named Arius. Don't name your kid Arius for two to, multiple reasons, all right? This, this, this Christian priest was named Arius, and he started teaching, saying, look, Jesus is the son of God, but that means what? He was born. He was created. And Arius taught that Jesus is not eternal. He is not fully God as God the Father is. Rather, Arius taught that Jesus was the first creation of God. He had a beginning. This is what Mormons will teach. This is what Jehovah's Witnesses will still teach today. And the problem was he was a very popular teacher. He'd put it in songs. He'd have awesome little choruses to convey his teaching. And this spread across the whole Roman Empire, debate and dispute within the churches. And it got so bad, it was said at a point, you could not go buy bread in the marketplace in Constantinople and not be asked, do you think Jesus is of the same essence as the Father or similar essence? Arius said he's the similar essence. Those who opposed him said he's the same essence as the Father. So Emperor Constantine had become a Christian, and so he was pro-Jesus, pro-church, and he did not like the debate and conflict in the church. So he said, okay, let's do something you've never been able to do before, because he just legalized our religion. We were persecuted before that. He said, for the first time, let's have a great council. Invite all the bishops, all the leaders from every part of the Roman Empire. You all come together. I want you to talk about this and figure it out. Is Arius right or is Arius wrong? And so people gathered together from all over the empire, and for two months they went back and forth and discussed and debated. And a bunch of Christian bishops showed up supporting Arius, but then when they actually heard some of Arius' writings being read, we're told they're like, wait a minute, yep, that's not right. And so the Council of Nicaea eventually condemned Arius and said, no, that is not, they didn't kill him, they condemned his teaching, I mean. They said, no, Jesus is not a created being. He is not the first of God's creations. He is actually eternal. He is fully God himself. And if he's not eternal, he couldn't be fully God. And it got so intense, by the way, there was a Christian there named St. Nicholas. Ever hear him? St. Nick? Jolly old St. Nick? Jolly old St. Nick? We are told, in the Council of Nicaea, got so upset at Arius, at one point he went up and punched Arius in the face leading to a beautiful meme of Santa Claus, which has him there. Actually, it's an icon of St. Nick. and says, I've come to deliver presents and punch heretics, and I'm all out of presents. <laughs> so um, the Council of Nicaea, they finally put out what we call the Nicene Creed, which is an early creed of the church describing what Christians believe. How many of you grew up in Lutheran churches or Roman Catholic churches where we would regularly recite the creed? Okay, that is a valuable practice. That is a good thing because this is the common belief of everyone who is an Orthodox Christian. And so let's read together the oldest version of the Nicene Creed that was generated out of that council. Uh, they tweaked some things, added to it in 381. Back in, 4, in 425 then, they added some more stuff about under, how should we understand Jesus' nature. But let's read the Nicene Creed here. I put it on the back of your outline. And you'll notice... There's a little bit at the top about God the Father. There's a little bit at the bottom about the Holy Spirit, and most of it is about Jesus. That's because the problem at Nicaea was how do we understand Jesus' divinity? 
And so they wrote this creed very carefully to show, look, the Christian belief is Jesus is fully God as is God the Father. Now, one question mark line for us there at the end says we believe, talks about the Catholic Church. And you might remember this when you were a kid. If I grew up Lutheran. And we said we, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And I remember as Lutherans, man, we were anti-Catholic. Like, Catholic, we're not Catholic, right? Okay, well, remember, in the year 325, there was only one church. It was the Catholic church. Catholic is simply a Greek word that means everywhere, in every place. It's just a way of talking about the universal church. So when we talk about the Catholic church in this sense, we don't mean the Roman Catholic church based out of Rome. We mean the universal church of which the Roman Catholic church is part. The Orthodox churches are part. The Protestant evangelical churches are part. So when we speak of the Catholic church in this sense, we just mean the one church scattered as it is across the world. So let's read this together, okay? As we confess our faith in union with all other Christians. We believe in one God, the Father all-governing, creator of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father as only begotten, that is, from the essence of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not created, of the same essence as the Father, through whom all things came into being, both in heaven and on earth, for who for us, men, and for our salvation, came down and was incarnate, becoming human. He suffered, and on the third day he rose and ascended into the heavens, and he will come to judge both the living and the dead. And we believe in the Holy Spirit. Okay, now look, there's a little PS tacked on here. Here's a little PS now targeting Arius. Read. But those who say, once he was not, or he was not before his generation, <clears throat> or he came to be out of nothing, or who assert that he, the Son of God, is of a different essence, or that he is a creature, or changeable, or mutable, the Catholic and Apostolic Church anathematizes them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, look at that funny word, anathematizes. Okay, this is interesting. Guess what language that is? It's Aramaic. That's the Aramaic term for cursed. Fascinating. Look back at your outline. Verse, um, back in part three, when Paul writes, if anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Paul uses the Aramaic there too, anathema. Okay, there's another remnant of the earliest language of the Aramaic speaking early Christians. And by the way, I'm wondering if I have a typo on here where it says he suffered the third day he rose. It should say he suffered. Uh, yeah, suffered under punch pilot, crucified, died. So I might have missed a the line there. But we do believe that Jesus also died. All right, so I need to go check that. I might have... Messed up the creed. Sorry, guys. Uh, okay, what else do we want to see? All right, yeah, so notice in, in Nicaea, we defined what we meant when we said Jesus was God. We didn't start believing Jesus was God. We believed Jesus was God from the very early days. We see it preserved here in this early prayer, come Lord. All right, let's wrap it up. Part five, look at your outlines. Ending where it began, grace and love in Christ. Verse 23. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Here Paul comes back to end the letter where he began, really. Two key definitive realities of our lives as Christians. God's grace and us being in Christ. So look back at the beginning of the letter. Verse 2 on the screen. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. Paul views the Corinthians as being in Christ, united to him. And called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So here Paul returns to this language that has undergirded everything he said about the Corinthians' relationship with God. First of all, grace. What is grace? Grace is a gift. God's favor given to us in Jesus who became human for us, suffered for our sins on the cross unto death, rose again on the third day. And we are granted this grace as we come to him. Well, how do we receive that salvation? How do we receive that grace? It comes by being in Christ. When we believe in Jesus, when we put our trust in him, we hear the message of the gospel is death, burial, and resurrection for us. We believe it. We pledge our allegiance to Jesus as Lord and Savior. And we are baptized. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, um, we are buried with Christ through baptism. We go under the water. It's like being buried in the ground with Jesus, like dying with him. 
We come out of the water, it's like being raised back to life and raised with him. At conversion, we're also baptized in the Spirit, meaning simply we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, part of the good news. The Holy Spirit lives within us. And so I think that's how this union with Christ works. We are in Christ because of the Holy Spirit. And when we're, when we're in Christ, his death becomes our death. His resurrection becomes our death, spiritually now, one day, physically at his return. And so here are two key realities of our life as believers, his grace to us and our union with Jesus through the Spirit. Look what he says last, verse 24. My love to all of you, again, in Christ Jesus. It's his only letter where he says something like that about how he loves them. Why might he feel inclined to have to write that at the end? Are they going to love everything he's written them in this letter? No, there's plenty in here they are not going to like. There's plenty that's going to ruffle their feathers. So you can almost be, almost be like, visual, I'm like, well, oh wait, I better, just, I better just clarify. Guys, I love you. I care about you. I'm not writing this letter to hurt you. I have your best interests at heart. And so he writes of his love for them. Okay, so bottom line, what do we do in light of this last little end of this letter? But also, let's ask that in light of the whole letter of 1 Corinthians, which we've slogged through for so long, uh, if you've been around here. Let's put it this way. Through life's messiness, hold on to the beauty of Christ. Through life's messiness, hold on to the beauty of Christ. I call this whole series, Messy but Beautiful Christianity. And we see in Paul's letters to 1 Corinthians, or to the Corinthians, all sorts of mess. I mean, there, there's so much dysfunction and pain and misunderstanding and failure and suffering and trouble in this church. It's really something. And yet we see that Paul interacts with them, pointing to the beauty of Jesus and what he has done and the power of the gospel to provide hope and transformation even in the middle of such things. So I think this is the lesson for us to learn. Through life's messiness, hold on to the beauty of Christ. Let me give you three suggestions. First, by believing the Lord Jesus Christ is fully God and human. All right, that, there's one of those core convictions that we have as believers in Jesus. As Christians, we believe that Jesus shared fully in our humanity, but also he shares fully in God the Father's divinity. And that's really mind-blowing, really, but it's really cool. And that's the real hope that God himself and the person of Jesus entered into our mess and redeemed it, not by standing aloof from it, but absorbing the worst of it and defeating it. Second, by fighting for loyalty, faithfulness, and love toward him. Remember Paul's warning of covenant faithfulness to the Christians in Corinth. If anyone doesn't love the Lord, let him be cursed. I think that's Paul's encouragement to the Corinthians to maintain their love, their faith, their allegiance to their Lord Jesus. And notice, we gotta fight for this. Why? Boy, there's so many things that try to pull us away. You know, there's so many competing things to love. So many competing things that seem to be beautiful in our world. So how about you this week? In this season of your life, what is the biggest danger to your loyalty to Jesus? What right now is seeking to pull you from him, to fill your mind with other things? Let's be on guard, as we saw last week. Third, by letting pain tune your heart to long for his coming. Boy, there's a lot of pain in this letter of 1 Corinthians. There's personal conflict. Um, there's sin. There's offending one another. There's suffering and death. Paul himself writes from a position of great suffering and hardship, and it'll only get worse by the time he writes 2 Corinthians. And I think that's inescapable, right? Pain, suffering, and loss. I mean, it's Memorial Day. What is that? It is essentially a commemoration of pain, suffering, and loss. This is part of this broken world. But I think what we must do is to try to leverage that pain to make us long for the coming of Jesus and his return and restoration of all things. We captivate our hearts and minds with the beauty of Christ and live in light of his return by which and for which we pray, Maranatha, Lord come. Okay, well here we conclude the book of 1 Corinthians as we look at Paul's final goodbye to the Corinthians, his final PS, if you will. And we saw through life's messiness, hold on to the beauty of Christ. Through life's messiness, hold on to the beauty of Christ. 
And the most beautiful aspect of Christ, I think, is his divinity and what that means as he became one of us and came to serve and to suffer in our place. So, uh, yeah, I don't use PSs too much uh, unless I am, oh, that's a lie. You know, I actually do use them all the time because I love them. You know, I love PS. I do it in emails. But then I worry in emails. I'm like, if I say, thanks, Greg, PS, sometimes they might miss that, you know, if you don't scroll down. So, um, but if I do a letter, I like to add a little PS there because, right, our eyes go to that and, oh, yeah, look at, wow, his handwriting's bad. You know, that's the bad part of that, you know. But it is a moment to emphasize some final point, some final emphasis. And for us, this is what we see here for Paul as he gives a final warning to covenant faithfulness, uh, reminds them of his love for them, and includes this prayer, which is so significant for us, Maranatha, which shows the early high view of Jesus as Lord and God. Let's pray. Yes, Father, we pray that we will be captivated by the beauty of Christ and what he did for us in suffering and dying from his place and the beauty of his resurrection and his triumph. And we pray that you will help us to long for that day and live in light of it and be faithful until then. And so we pray with the whole church, Maranatha. Amen.